Yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Mark Craddock. I've been warding mapping for over 10 years-ish. Worked on, you know, did maps of the House of the Parliament, of the Cabinet Office, Land Registry, Cross Government and in the private sector. But we're going to talk about maps in the form of thinking about data and, and creating intelligence today. Now, the second part of the presentation, it does get a little bit dark because I'm going to go into what we do with the police and online harm. So you're welcome to leave at that point. So let's just get into it. So let me just share my screen. Here we go. Let's get into it. Oh, there's my Twitter if you want to talk to me on Twitter at any point. Right, so we're just going to talk about kind of data, situation awareness and intelligence. And I've got some use cases across the, you know, the government and the various research and online harms. And, you know, all is straight with awarded maps. Done over 100 maps just this year in the last 12 months. So I've picked a selection of maps, only a, only a handful. Um, and we'll talk through them and we'll talk through why we create those maps and how we use those maps. So not all maps are used for strategy. Sometimes they're used to get a point across and tell stories, but they do, in, they do inform strategy. So, you know, you all know the background of awarded maps, you know, the, the books on I mentioned earlier from Amazon. There's also the work from GCHQ on boiling frogs. And there's obviously this use case edition today, but I actually used this slide for um, the AWS user group I did last week. So if you want a bit more technical stuff about some of the stuff I'm doing, Look up the AWS user group London last week. I did some presentations there. So if we talk about, you know, creating intelligence and situation, situation awareness. So across the, you know, government's police and commercial organizations, we want, you know, we want that to understand the landscape and to do that, we need access to data and to do, to take that data, we need to analyze it or in the police do detecting detective work against that data to understand, you know, to build up that kind of intelligence and then give you that kind of situation where, you know, where, where, the, where are all the crimes happening, who are the perpetrators, you know, what, what, what do we know about them? How can we, you know, how can we catch, prevent and pursue these people? So there's many sources of data that we can use. So we've got, you know, open and proprietary sources. We can use data from mobile phones. We can use satellite imagery. Uh, we can use open data. So uh, a good source of understanding what you can do with data is the open source intelligent community. So if you look, you know, search for hash OS in, that's very good. And also there's lots of in insight we can get from uh, social media. So the, the thing about data and doing the analysis, there's always this yin and yang of the algorithms and the data and also the methodology. So we need to think about these in different ways, depending if they're, you know, on the left hand side of a water map or the right hand side of the water map. Now I can see, I think Simon's in the session and I think the you know the axis that talks about data in warding maps is a bit weak when we talk about you know unmodeled to modeled because i think there's more characteristics of a modeled data than just being modeled so it, you know it needs to be available as a you know as a service really so it's so it's easy to consume and we when we look at data that's you know kind of new and novel so let's say self-driving cars if, if someone gave you a dump all the data from a self-driving car you know what would you do with it what would it look like you know you may have data from ai outputs from scanning from imagery from you know all the sensors in the car and we you know would we know what to do it probably not it's new and novel and we we need different techniques to look and understand that so there's going to be lots of experimenting and playing with that data then there would be if it's data on the kind of right hand side which would be modeled and where you know it's kind of well known and well understood or it should be well known and well understood and just because it's modeled doesn't mean it's well known well understood and that data can be used for purposes i will go a bit slower jesper so when we, so if we take, so we, we go through this kind of evolution of there from, you know, batch, we're going from batch and data, maybe running jobs overnight to live streaming the data. So that data is constantly streamed into the platform. And that means we need kind of different practices to understand that data. So before you may, you know, load the data over a night or a weekend or even monthly, and you'd have some, you know, you have a certain methodology for that. You'd have certain processes in place. But when you switch to live to streaming data, you need completely different practices and process. And that, you know, that, that also impacts the, the quality of data. So again, you know, we may want the quality to be very high on the right hand side of the map and not so concerned about the quality on the left hand when it's kind of new and novel, because it's more about experimenting than it is kind of producing outputs. So here's the first map. So in this case, it was work I do with the national statistic offices and they have a need to create official statistics. So official statistics are used to inform policy, you know, to decide funding, et cetera. And they, they were looking at data science and artificial intelligence and kind of machine learning. 
But the, the key thing for the statistical offices is the methodologies, the algorithms, and the data sources. And across, you know, across all the statistical statistical offices globally, they are they have diff access to different data sources, they use different algorithms, and they use different me methodologies to produce the same output. So GDP, for example. It's there, there's a high-level guide from the UN saying this is how you should produce uh, your GDP figures and other figures, but it's really down to each uh, country to decide how they do that. And they use different data sources, they use different algorithms, and they use different methodologies. So, for example, the census carried out in Denmark, they have access to uh, what's called administration data. So that's the, the data the government holds on us. And they can produce their census overnight with four people. The UK has just ran our census, and that took a very large team and £900 million to produce our census. And that's mainly because we work in this kind of custom build area. And the US census, I think, was 15, no, 1.5 billion, was it? I think, I can't remember exactly. But that's because, you know, our statistical offices, uh, not all of them, focus on custom building and, you know, they, we must have all the data, we must, we must put it in our, our own data center, we, you know, and that causes issues about access to data and capabilities, etc. And they, what they really should be focusing on is, you know, can we leverage cloud? Can we, can we run these algorithms in the cloud? Should we be working on the new novel areas of artificial intelligence and machine learning to take advantage of those capabilities to produce uh, statistics, official statistics? Now, the stats office will have two types of statistics. One is official, and that being used for policy making, and the other one's experimental, and that's where they, you know, they play with. Um, they play with their custom built tools and custom built algorithms to create experimental statistics, but really they should be, you know, experimenting maybe more on the left and more on the right. But here we go. So as an example, if we take OpenStreetMap, so this is, you know, quietly what, you know, well known, well understood data, data sets is available, you know, all languages pretty much accessible on all clouds. You can use your own instance or you can use a cloud version. And on top of that, you know, for, for example, if you have the infrastructure map of the UK, so someone's collected data, built the, the electricity lines, the pipelines, access to the, you know, our windmill farms offshore. And then top of that, other people have built an energy map, you know, where, where does, is it battery storage, is it nuclear? And what we see, what Simon was talking about earlier, is that kind of innovate, leverage and commoditize, where the open street map has been made available and then someone's built new uh, in this case, data services on top of that. So we've got the infrastructure map and the and the energy energy map has been built on top of an existing system. Now, for, oh, this was from the AWS group last week. So, for example, you know, Amazon has got a ton of data available in the cloud that you can go and build a huge amount of insight and kind of situation awareness and intelligence from you know from understanding your own organization to understanding competitors. But you know, the sim the data sets are similar across. Azure, Google, and Alibaba, they all have access to the similar, similar data sets. Now, one example is uh, Wonso. So they use the open data from Sentinel satellites, and they've analyzed that data using machine learning techniques, and they've basically mapped every single field and identified the crops of North America and Europe. And I think they aim to do the work by the end of, end of next year. So if we zoom in a bit, you can see every, every field's kind of mapped and every kind of crop or the most common crops are actually been identified. And from that, you can you can start doing uh, crop yields. You can even get into monitoring um, individual farms and telling them where to put the water, if there's enough water, if there's enough nutrients, and you can get quite sophisticated uh, agri-tech uh, capabilities. So just to recap, you know, we've got our data, it, it, you know, it's on the, it's on the unmodeled or modeled or, you know, new novel and, and we need different techniques to use that data. And we also need different people, I think, to, you, to, to analyze and work with that data as well. And then we've got the examples of like one so There's also that send to agri there, there's a link to it. So there's an open source capability to basically take Sentinel imagery, imagery and do agricultural kind of statistics from that. And there's also VenusSat, which is quite interesting. So the EU have developed a, an open source capability where you can identify crops of wine and grapes and then start doing analysis on on crops and wine and get into kind of doing crop yields and then how much do you pay for grapes and where are the grapes and are there enough grapes is that going to impact my wine yield etc now one other use case is the un global platform so i worked on this for two and a half years i did present it at the uh, aws user group a couple of years ago in july and at the time in july you know we didn't under we didn't know about the impact of covid we didn't know covid was coming but we, we we built a platform for creating official statistics and helping 193 countries around the world 
you know, to use big data and develop new techniques using Python and R. And one of the things that we developed, you know, using Wardy Maps, there's a map, was to, you know, look at some kind of data that was available that people could use and consume easily and use that to experiment and develop new official statistics. So one of those data sets was flights and ships. And th those, those data sets were streamed into the platform. So they were, they're kind of well known, well understood. They were not just modeled, but they were actually available as a service. And we could use APIs to call, you know, get access to that data and just stream that data into the platform. Now, this is basically the Wardley map we created. And I think it's been shown a couple of times at a map camp before, but really this, you know, this shows a map of different components for, but really the strategy for the UN global platform was about competition. It was about ensuring 103, 90, 193 companies competed with each other to help develop algorithms and methodologies to produce official statistics. Now, I think we saw it earlier from Simon about the innovate, leverage, and commoditize. Now, this was changed uh, slightly in the UN because leverage wasn't considered to be a nice word. So we changed it to innovation zone, exploration zone, and trusted zone with the idea that all the statistical offices around the world would anybody could innovate anybody could create anything and then in the exploration zone we would kind of identify particular algorithms or methodologies or data sets that were useful for maybe the more than one certificate of statistical office we would then bring that into the platform and commoditize it and make it available to all statistical offices so the good example is the flights and ships data so we saw lots of offices working with flights you know adsb and flight and ship data which was ais we brought that into the platform using the streaming service into the platform, and we made that data available to all the statistical, statistical offices. So we were streaming about, well, we streamed over 100 billion records of flight data and 80,000 records a day of ship data. Now, this led to, you know, a crisis. there's a dashboard, but there's also the underlying data above it, uh, below it. So the blue dots are the, with the flights in the, the, really the, I guess the airports and stuff and the green lines of the ship. So you can see the various shipping, shipping pathways, you know, other Suez Canal and others. And you can see where the bottlenecks could be created if there were issues and there have been in the, in the past. So, um, all these, all these algorithms and methodologies that were created by the UN are shared and published in the UN's marketplace. Uh, so it's marketplace.officialstatistics.org. And overall, the UN Global Platform, just the shipping and flight air side of it, there's a lot more to it, enabled the UK to save, you know, at least 12 billion. So when we had the financial crisis in 2008, it took the Office of the National Statistics 12 weeks to produce the official statistic to say, you know, we're doomed. Yeah, the economy is going to crash. You know, there's a big financial crisis. So that basically cost the UK economy 1 billion every week before you know, the treasury, the cabinet office and the bank of England could implement their changes because there were no official statistics to say we're doomed. And then 12 weeks later, you know, the official statistics said we're doomed. And then the bank of England, you know, could put, you know, implement their measures like quantitative easing and all that kind of stuff. Now this time with COVID, because we had the, the platform, we had access to all the flight and ships data. When, you know, the cabinet office rang up the office for national statistics said, are we doomed? There was a little panic. And then, you know, using the UN global platform, it was quite easy to produce some indicators to show that there were no, there was no trade coming out of China. You know, there was no cargo, it wasn't moving. And we could see, you know, based on flights, and all this is open data, based on flights, you know, out of China, we could see which countries would probably be impacted most by COVID. So that indicators were given back to the, you know, the cabinet office, the treasury and the bank of England, and then they made their, took their appropriate actions to, you know, save 12 billion by implementing their measures earlier than they would not would have normally right so another good uh, example of kind of using data and intelligence but no no more than map this because uh, we were kind of on the edge we we enabled this by enabling the platform but this was not just the technical side of it but the procurement side of it so working with a cloud broker strategic blue we we, we enabled the ice cube project to uh, get access to every single gpu of every single region of every single cloud over a weekend. So down in the South Pole, there's a, there's a square kilometer of sensors that um, track neutrinos. So neutrinos is a, a particular type of particle 
that's very difficult to see, very difficult to track, but it does generate a little bit of light when it interacts with other particles. So when it um, flows through up a square column of ice, you can see the light, and then using all the sensors, they can then track that neutrino back to the a galaxy far, far away. Yeah, so there's a really good documentary on it, uh, the neutrino hunting the ghost particle. I'd recommend you watch that if you're interested in this. But basically, the, the team um, using created a HPC using Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, and they basically requested every single GPU from every single region from every cloud over a large week, over a weekend to produce, you know, nearly the second largest HPC at that time, which is just a little bit smaller than the summit one. And, you know, they, they were unable to run their analysis to, to track these neutrinos and uh, identify where they came from. And, you know, this is, comes from a galaxy far, far away. There's a, there's some links to the, the articles and how they did that there. I'll share the slides after. So if you're really interested in the technical detail, you can find out how they did it. Okay. Oh, now we're going to get into the dark bit in a minute. So we're going to, going to get into the online harms. So if you want to leave, that's absolutely fine. If you want to stay, it does come with a bit of a warning. Yeah. But if you want to go in, look at the foundation in Wardy mapping or the awareness exams and certification we developed, here's the, here's the token now. So you get a bit of a discount. Yeah. And we'll forgive you for leaving. We don't, you know, we don't care. Yeah. So I'm, just going to give everybody a few seconds to leave if you want to leave, but we're just going to get into the bit about online harms and right. So there's the warning. Yeah. At the end of this, if you do feel you need to go and take a, another look at this, the think, you know, web is very good for parents and children to understand, uh, the impacts of online harms. Right. So there we go. So this is a warning map that I did about the pornography industry. And the reason this map was created, wasn't really for strategic uh, purposes. It was to get a point across. So if we look at this map, we can see, you know, if you want to view pornography, you've got to search for it, you know, you can find photographs, videos, or you can join live streaming sites. Someone has to produce this uh, material and they advertise it, social media sites and bots and whatnot. And, you know, you can see in the, the past, you know, it used to be on physical media now it's kind of moved to digital and it used to be, you know, photographs and tapes and DVDs, and then, you know, getting into sex dolls. And the, the content was produced, you know, either in theaters, now in studio, now the content is produced in bedrooms, you know, with, with models. So if we look at the stats on the left-hand side, we can see, now this is data published by the Pornhub, which is one of the largest sites, but not the only one, you know, in every minute in 2019, there was 80,000 visits to, and 77,000 searches to their site. Every minute, you know, 14, 15,000 profiles were viewed. I mean, that year, over 98,000 new models joined the pool and, you know, that gave them a, a verified of over 130,000 models on the, on the Pornhub, you know, producing content in their bedroom. Um, in, you know, I guess the same way we see kids, you know, using TikTok, you know, they basically, you know, what, what we can see is this, the, the kind of industrialization of the commoditization of the kind of sex industry. And we see, you know, using more commodity type capabilities. And then in the future, you know, we've got, you know, we've got VR coming and we've got digital twins and, you know, we can expect stuff to move into that area as well. And one interesting, so number seven point here. So when uh, Facebook had their largest crash, there's probably a, another larger crash now, but in March 13, 2019, you know, there's a big Facebook crash and uh, Pornhub saw their traffic increase by 11% because I guess people needed to find something else to do. Now, part of this map was to tell a story about how, you know, the, the porn industry was driving innovation, how the porn industry, you know, leverages, innovates and leverages and commoditizes stuff very quickly. And how their kind of agility to do things and leverage, you know, new technology. Now, if we change a couple of these components in this map, so if we say, instead of models, it's victims, and if it's, it's not recruitment, it's, um, it's grooming, we end up with a completely different map and a completely different view of, you know, online digital social platforms and, and others. So, you know, what we know from the data published by uh, the UK government, you know, in the UK alone, there's est estimated to be 80,000 people who present a sexual threat to children online. And what we know is, you know, they're using these techniques, they're using the same capabilities, they're, they're able to innovate, they're able to lever leverage and commoditize services, they're, they're, they, they don't have any problems, you know, using the latest compute techniques, cloud, social media, 
and, gen and in general, they hide in plain sight on the kind of right, right hand side of the map across social media platforms and others. Yeah? And, you know, just, you know, the law enforcement, number four on this, you know, the law enforcement agencies in the UK are currently arresting around 450 individuals and safeguarding 600 children each month, you know, to combat the, this, this, you know, the use of this kind of material and actions, yeah. So, you know, this, and if we, if we, you know, really want to understand where, you know, this is going, we can look at the map, we can understand it. It is quite dark, but, you know, just looking at this uh, point nine down on the map, we can see, you know, this this website generated.photos has uh, 9,000 beautified AI generated child child photos. So, you know, if you need a picture of a child for a, a brochure or something, you can go and get one. And then we've got um, the developments, you know, in the gaming industries around kind of meta humans where you can really create virtual people. And we've also got, you know, emotional chatbots. So there's one called replica.ai, sells itself to be a promotional, emotional chatbot. So, you know, you're having a bad day, you can have a chat with a bot. Yeah. But also these, these techniques and these uh, capabilities will be leveraged at some point by perpetrators for, you know, for bad things. Yeah. And we, we know this and we can predict this. We can look at the map and we can see where, where, you know, where it's going to head and we can take the appropriate actions. So one of those actions and one of those things that shows on the map is the, the UN as a convention on rights of children. You know, so any, any, any person under the age of 18 is a child. You know, there's, there's, I think there's like 50 different points in the legislation uh, on in the, in the convention. And, you know, there's no discrimination that children have the, the right to play and rest and, and, you know, they have, they have right for protection from violence. They have a right of protection from harmful work and, you know, from drugs. Now, there is only one country in the world that has not ratified this agreement, and that's the US. And, uh, you know, this is where most of our social media comes from. This is where we've seen on the maps earlier that perpetrators tend to hide in plain sight. And every successful, every successive president you know, from Clinton, Bush, Obama, Trump, and even to Joe Biden have not ratified this agreement. So we need to be very careful with these platforms. Now in the UK, there is, you know, we understand this, there is legislation going through online harms. So there's an online harms bill, and this was one of the maps we created for the online harm. So if you're, you know, if you're building a service in the cloud, you, you know, you're, you're the product owner. So, you know, you, you want to protect your users, you want to comply with legislation as well. You know, how, how do you stop images of inappropriate images being uploaded to your platform? Now there are the authorities around there, they do hold databases of imagery, but the hashes of the images, not the images, the hash of the image. And it's possible to compare one image to another. Do they have the same hash? Then you know, that's uh, inappropriate content and you can block it, remove it, notify the authorities, whatever. Now these databases that store this content, some are very custom built and, and proprietary and very difficult to access. The one in Canada is, Canada is a bit more easier to access. But what we, when we create this map, we were, you know, we were trying to understand how, how can we, how can we protect the children, how we can protect the owners of the website. And I think a really good example is the work Cloudflare have done. So, you know, the CDN. There is an option within the uh, settings to tick a box saying, you know, scan images and, you know, block notify content of known of bad images, let's say. Yeah. So you, they, they have access to the hash, the hash algorithm. They can hash your image. Is it compared to an existing hash? Yes. Right. You're uploading something that shouldn't be shared. Right. Then they can take the appropriate, appropriate action. So there is uh, some work on this on the home. So Graham Francis is the lead for this at the DCMS in the UK. So if you're um, interested in doing something to Cloudflare, you run a CDN or a similar type of service, you can contact Graham and he'd be more than welcome to have a conversation about how you could get involved and how the, the work the UK government is doing on safety tech, how you can get involved in that. So this is another map. Now this is a map, I've had to just wipe some bits out of it, but this is a real map. Now this talks about how, you know, how did, how does the, how did the police and the, our other services, you know, protect us from these kind of perpetrators. So we can, this is quite a busy map, but I'll, I'll, so they, you know, for the police, they have, you know, one of the things is pursue, protect and prevent. And to do that, they need, you know, they need situational awareness and intelligence. Who, who are the perpetrators? What are they doing? Where, you know, where are they based? what services are using. And to do that, you need to do 
kind of analysis yeah, of, of various data or, or a detective, you know, this, 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 you know, this is what they do. And to, to get access to that, you need, you know, access to different data sources. Uh, you know, and some data sources are well known and widely available, you know, like uh, geospatial data that you could get from, you know, Amazon and Google, for example. And, you know, even mobile phone data is probably more in the kind of product space where they have tools to analyze mobile phone data. And then, you know, in the example on this one, on the far left, we've got like self-driving cars. You know, are they going to be used by perpetrators for crimes in the future? And it, which they probably will be. And we can probably predict this by looking at the map. But, you know, what 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 are our authorities doing to understand these new and novel forms of uh, data? So if someone just came a dump from a self-driving car, what, what would it look like? How would we use it? And how would we use that, you know, to pre prevent and pre pursue crimes? Yeah. Now, so one of the things on the, you can see from this map is on the left hand side, most of our authorities are custom build everything. You know, it costs a lot of money. So the, the left hand side of the map here, there's, I think it's one, one, about 1.5 billion pounds from our, our policing, you know, to create the intelligence and situation awareness and analyze crimes, you know, and, and they're, they're hampered by current legislation and current standards. And all the crooks are on the right hand side using mobile phones, social media, you know, paying 50 pounds a month for their services or getting them for free, hiding in plain sight and accelerating at a fast rate away from our, our current uh, police forces, yeah, and services. So, you know, for the police forces to, you know, to catch up and analyze this sheer amount of data, you know, they need to look at using and leveraging you know, cloud and data science and machine learning techniques and, you know, building out those skills about data science and, and cloud and, you know, kind of moving into this area where they can actually start analyzing this data and sharing it at scale. So let's get into a big bit of news, our spooks. So, you know, our spooks are moving to the cloud. So, you know, looking at the previous maps, it's understandable that they would be using cloud. It is understandable that the sheer amount of data and the analysis they need to do to get that intelligence and situation awareness, they need to move to the cloud. Now, there are a couple of techniques on here called MPC and FHE, and they allow you to encrypt data at source and still put it into a cloud and still protect it. And I'm sure they're looking, looking at that. And there's, there's quite a lot of research going on that, on those areas. So going back to our spooks map, yeah, you know, the spooks, they want intelligence. So, you know, they want to use artificial uh, intelligence and, and, and data science and cloud to do that. And this is kind of like a bit new to them. So, you know, they'll have a range of algorithms and methodologies, and some will be new and novel, some will be, you know, well known and well understood. And I think the, you know, the biggest challenges for the people, new, you know, for the spooks and other, and other agencies and other governments and other commercial organizations globally is this kind of move into the cloud. So, you know, what, what, we, what we see is that, you know, the black line show kind of inertia. So, you know, I've got a physical firewall, but I need to use a virtual one in, in the cloud, and, you know, and people will find various reasons not to do that. And we got our, clear, our cloud skills and our working practices. So, and these, these show up as various different forms of inertia. So, you know, one way to overcome, you know, to build up those, the inertia around like cloud skills is to give access to, you know, like cloud sandpits, let people play in the cloud, let them spend too much money, let them learn to turn things off and actually build up these kind of working practice. So I think, you know, the biggest risk to our, our spooks is around the kind of training and that kind of awareness of co-evolution of uh, new practices based around cloud. So when you move from data center to cloud to serverless, you need to think about the different practices and, you know, and the way you operate when you use those services. And you can see that in a map, you know, you, you can see, you know, the biggest risk for our spooks is probably on the left-hand side here with their cloud skills and work practices. But I wouldn't be too concerned because if we look at uh, one of the other things I used Wardy Maps for was the, the G Cloud is a, a procurement framework in the UK that allows government to buy cloud services. So as I was at the Amazon user group last week, I, I just use Amazon as an example. So, you know, over the, since the framework's been running, Amazon, the UK government have purchased 267 million pounds worth of cloud services from Amazon. You can see hundred million from the revenue customs, 72 million from the home office, the DWP, Ministry of Justice, and that's through Amazon in Europe, but they did start buying directly from Amazon in, in the US. So there's, you know, 367 million pounds worth of cloud services that have been purchased um, by the UK government and various different organizations. So I wouldn't be too concerned about people using cloud services and their kind of capabilities around that. So if you want to go and analyze that data yourself, there's a link to it. You can filter search and you can build 
you can understand what cloud services the government's buying, who's buying them, how much they're paying, where they're buying it from, and then you can use that, you know, to understand your competitors or understand the market and where the opportunities are. So, so just to recap, you know, when we look at data, we need to think about it, our methodologies, our algorithms, and our data sources from, you know, the, the new novel to the unmodeled and modeled. And we need to think about using different practices and techniques from the left and the right. So that's me, my presentation finished. So I don't know if anybody, I don't know how many people are still here, but I can open up, if people want to kind of join and ask questions, I can, I think I can let you in somehow. So if anybody wants to request they join, I'm not sure how you do that. Yeah, I, I can see someone just said that FX is a commodity. I think if we, if we look back, I think, you know, if we, if we look at FX globally across the UN and that FX, tends to vary and the understanding of ethics. So I, I wouldn't actually say ethics was a commodity. I'd probably say it's probably somewhere in, in the middle, somewhere of the map. Do you want to ask questions in the chat area? Oh, here you go. Uh, welcome, Simon. Hey, fantastic. Really, really fascinating stuff. Of all the stuff you've done, GCLEP, the police, to to the UN, to, to UK uh, government in terms of monitoring. How much... It, it, I'm just, Personally, out of curiosity, how much do you think you've saved or made an impact in terms of could you give a monetary amount as a result of? Well, definitely twelve billion for the COVID, impact of COVID. That's so. I guess the how, how can I say that right? So if you look, there's a Bean report that was produced about statistics, and it quotes one billion per month, one billion per week of the impact of, of the delay of producing statistics. Yeah, and we know that using the platform, getting those indicators out about the impact of COVID. That, that was done over a, a very long weekend with lots of hard work from the data science campus and we know the government was in a position to make decisions and they understood you know covid was real and had a real impact right so 12 billion yeah now that same platform was also used by the us and at least another dozen other countries and they shared the algorithms and methodologies around covid so i would say probably 100 billion yeah you know, ish. Yeah. And I think I would say, you know, using it out of the House of the Parliament, you know, that's where we, we use mapping to, you know, do the cloud first policy. But the impact there is is probably about Parliament being able to do the job quicker. So when there was a every time there's a change of parliament, you know, all the MPs get fired and they all have to we have to vote them in and we get a whole lo load of new MPs and it can take twelve weeks for them to get their, their kit to do the parliamentary job. Yeah. But now because it's in the cloud, because they're using Office three six five yeah they get it they get it as soon as they're voted in yeah so they can they can they can start the job quicker so there's a, there's an impact there about you know parliament and policy and government making decisions quicker but yeah so you know lots I guess. lots <laughs> lots i mean well i i think jackie taylor who will, will say she trumps you on the monetary amount given the mapping stuff she did with the g20 she i think she calculates it in the in the trillions actually but yeah well, well i would say you know mine's backed up by official statistics so, <laughs> so so but, but there's another side to this because if i look at go agile go and so james Finn. so after hs2 he went to work with the rnli mm. because they used to open standards part of it was brought on because of this whole mapping stuff as well they they, they managed to reduce the call out time significantly mm. which actually leads to actual saved lives now a lot of your stuff uh, that you were talking about is criminal activity it's online mm. harmed and of course that has a very material it, it, potential material impact not in terms of monetary but mm. in terms of a person's experience and, and their, their their life experience so one of the things i'm, I'm always fascinated by is uh, pre-mortem post-mortem so have there been are there any metrics in, uh, in term in terms of how much impact this is hoped to have is there any sort of like post-mortem plans to do post-mortem analysis because obviously the maps themselves are dynamic constantly changing is there any of that sort of are you involved with any of that yes yeah, so I'm, I'm not directly involved with it anymore i would say graham francis would be the best person to tweet to and ask him i'm sure he would be happy to share you know what he's doing around online harms and I think on the police side, they're just getting into that. So they're, you know, hopefully they won't go off and build 43 different AI systems and data science capabilities to all do things separately. Hopefully though, that'll be, you know, thought of more strategically and they'll do something joined up and across police forces and they won't, you know, do it individually. Yeah. 
Right. Well, hopefully, the, I'm sure the big consultancies will be in there trying to persuade them they well, all they're, need they're, their own AI. They're uh, already there. Oh, they're already there, Simon. They're already, you know. Yeah. 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 Horrors, yes, oh, yeah. but uh, good. Oh, that was the end of my question, so I will uh, I disappear and let somebody else ask a question. But in the absence of anybody saying, I, 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 I'm just going to say thank you for everything you've done. I, I know that uh, G Cloud has saved considerable uh, amounts of money. I mean, you know, you're mentioning about 300 million in terms of use of, for example, more cloud services. When I wrote the Better for Less paper with Liam and others back in 2009, I mean, the closest that we could get to in terms of IT spending was 18, I think it was 18 to 21 billion a year, mm. not even to the nearest billion. So I, I, I know I can sometimes be quite a critic in terms of you know, some of the changes that Never. have happened in GDS. But I, I've got to say, uh, yeah, there was some really outstanding work. Yeah, so that, I mean, that 300 million was just on, Am that's what government just spent on Amazon. So there's been 10 billion spent through the framework. Yeah. Yeah. And when we, when I was there, I, just, it's, I think it's going up to 10 years uh, in February next next year. But when we, when we looked at it, we, we were seeing, you know, agencies and government departments saving 90% on what they were spending before. Yeah. But by using cloud. Yeah. Now, on that point, I'm going to leave because you have questions in the Q&A. Ah, I do. Right, okay. I'll start at the top. How much time did you invest to bring the customs up to speed and in line with the map, with map understanding? So I think it depends. So some people get map, they get map straight away and it's really, it's an easy conversation. And sometimes you just don't mention the maps. You talk about the outcomes and the stories and the strategy and your understanding of the landscape. Um, not, not necessarily the map. And it tends to be, you can, my experience, you can do the maps with the enterprise architects and the product owners uh, within the organization. And sometimes when you uh, move up to the, you know, the, the CTOs and the CDOs, sometimes, you know, you may want to step away from maps and you, you talk about, you know, the strategy and why the strategy is, is sense. But you can, but I think, you know, a lot of people understand this kind of uh, genesis to the commodity. So that's, that's always worth talking about, but it's, it really, my experience is not always, it's not really about the map. Yeah. It's about the outcome you get. But another one, you mentioned your related talks on the subject. Did you have a link? Yes. Yeah, so all the links are in the slides. I'll share the slides. So I did a, last week. I did the user, the Amazon user group in London. Two years ago, I did, did the talk, which was quite detailed into the global platform and a bit more around the tech in Amazon. I did the open FOSS, free and open, open source geo, geospatial FOSS 4G. I did that in the summer. So there's more talk about maps and open source and why open source, open source is a weapon. So there's some stuff there. Oh, right. So Roberto, you notice that the map for has changed over time. Yeah. So what you, what I tend to use for maps, let me just move this around a minute. So. The maps at the beginning, so these type of maps, so I basically, I mean, Simon shared the template with me and I used that, I put that map, those templates into Google Slides. And when we were collaborating online, you, know, you can get many people into a Google Slide and you can sort of drag it around, adding components and you can use Google Slide, Slides collaboration capabilities to, to build a map uh, with remote people. And that's my preferred way of creating maps. Um, and when I was doing work with other organizations though, we did use, so this, this look, for example, this was using Wenvula. So it's from a company called Rainmaker and they have a platform that allows you to create maps, but the benefit of their platform is you can, when you put components on the map, you can actually get the metadata behind that. So you can actually start un understanding uh, your maps across maps. So you can start building those kind of profile maps and you get access to the, the data in, you know, in. Google slides is just a dot and a, and a word, but, um, if you use the Wenvula tool, then you've actually got access to the data layer below it. So you can see how many times have we used cop, uh, capex and opex in a map. And you can also reuse components across maps as well. So that's kind of why they, why they look different from Chris moving to cloud. Is there a specific event that caused this to happen? I think, you know, when I started looking at cloud and using maps, I think it was over 10 years ago, it was really about from a user's point of view of kind of that access to work from anywhere, more flexibility, not locked into the data center and really using, using access to the commodity devices. So like Apple iPads and stuff. 
So if you want to use them, you need to, well, it's, it's easier to use them if you're using cloud services. And more recently, I think the COVID is pushing a lot of the enterprises to cloud. So we just got someone who's going to join us. I just clicked the plus button. I don't know where you are. No. Okay. I'll carry on. Right. Yeah. So uh, I think by now, I think it's the, you know, it's the, the fact that you, you know, you move to cloud and you've got no choice over it really. If you look at the, um, some of the patterns from Simon, you know, there, there is no choice over evolution. So you have no choice going to cloud. So I think everybody's kind of realized they're going to cloud now. Um, about 10 years later. So John, he's brand new to this. What's a good starting place? I would start with Simon's book. Look at the training from Ben, go to the map camps and practice. So, you know, get out of the templates and start creating your own maps. And if you're in the public sector, there's quite a lot of people that have set up groups to do mapping. And I'm sure there's some across the commercial space and, and different joined up and but I would just find someone to map with really. So if, if you can't find anybody, give me a shout and we can do some maps together. So I think I've answered all the questions. If anybody wants to join us for a chat in the last few minutes, is there any specific areas you'd like me to go over in a bit more detail? Oh, Chris. Hello, Chris. Hi, Mark. <laughs> I mean, I'm not joining for a chat. I'm just joining to close the session. Oh, oh you I'm, are. I'm, 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 in case if there's nobody else that, that wants to speak. Oh, Simon, what is your, what is your biggest failure in mapping? Getting fired for mapping, Simon. <laughs> yeah. Being bullied, being intimidated and basically making people look foolish by using maps. But at the same time, you know, there's the other side of that, which is, you know, identifying these individuals and, you know, making life hard for them. <laughs> Why? Why what, Simon? What is your biggest failure? Do you want to jump back in, Simon? Here you come. Hi, Simon. Hello. So leading on from carrying on from that question, I think, what is your biggest faith? So why did that happen? And, and, and also what lessons did you learn or should we learn from that? Yes. Well, so I would, so other, you know, I got really excited about mapping and I thought everybody should use maps and I was showing maps and what it tended to do was to embarrass people. Yeah. If, I mean, if you spend five, 10, 30 minutes talking about the basics of it, you kind of get, oh yeah, this all makes sense. And then you say, well, well, why are you building your own data center? <laughs> oh, and they, you know, oh shit, I shouldn't be building my own data center. And from, so what I would say now is I would, so the thing is to try and talk about the map, but that doesn't always work. And I think what I try to do is find the willing in the organization and work with them. Yeah. Cause there's always a, a quite a handful of people who get it and people that want to make change or, and especially people that um, are struggling to tell the story or, you know, they know we've got to go to cloud. We don't know, you know, it's inevitable we go to cloud, for example, but they, they can't express it. Yeah. So working with those people, drawing the maps and explain to them. And for me, it's always not about being me telling the story and the strategy is getting the buy-in from the people that kind of get it, get the mapping, but also are responsible for delivering the strategy and getting them to put the message across and understanding the, you know, the techniques, the political techniques you need in an organization. So you know, you need to kind of get buy-in from all different levels and you can identify particularly difficult people. And sometimes they're not difficult because they're difficult. It's difficult because they, they don't understand or they do understand and they understand, you know, they may, they may, you know, the data center manager won't be able to hug the servers anymore, but then he's spending time to explain, well, actually, well, this isn't what you do, but maybe there's something else for you to do in the future. So I remember well, there's one thing in the houses of parliament, they, is very good by the, the CTO at the time. She said, well, basically, look, but everything is changing, you know, anybody can get any job, you know, it's going to be, there's going to be a change. Yeah. So, and you know, we saw some people that wanted to work with servers and racket stack and they, they left, which is absolutely fine. Yeah. And others, people that worked in the data center saw the, saw the future. And instead of being, you know, managing the services in the data center, they ended up being, you know, managing the partners for the, you know, the, like, you know, the Amazon and the Microsoft instead. So they, they, they was doing the same kind of role, but instead of managing servers, they were managing you know, like people in contracts and, and I, and I think that it's, it's understanding or having a better understanding of the impact to people of the maps. And when you talk about the map. So I I've had similar to type things in terms of, which is why I think it's important once you map a space out and you apply patterns is to add that inertia. You actually had the table, uh, 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 inertia. I don't know if you can flick to that. Yep. There you go. There we are. So these are, um, basically the 16 different forms of inertia that I've come across. 
out through through mapping and simple things change of business relationship loss of existing financial capital loss of political capital so the whole investment all of these whenever you map out a space and you apply those patterns if you're going to change it i i, I literally go through this table ticking off <laughs> have I thought of this? Have I thought of this? Have I thought of this? Because I've come across them all. And, and sometimes, yes, I, I, yeah. part of the problem is when maps expose things that we've done and allow others to challenge the assumptions that we've made, because we can get wrapped up in our stories. If we, it's like the insurance company, if it spent 10 million on robots and then somebody come along, why didn't we just use standard bracks? I mean, you're not going to be a popular perfer <laughs> for, for pointing that out. Okay. It's only 10 million. I mean, you know, we've got examples, you know, people who spend hundreds of millions. By the way, you've got a question from Vicky. Vicky's one of my favorite people in the whole mapping community. I don't know if Vicky uh, is willing to come and join and, and to, to, to answer the question for me, uh, uh, me encouraging other people to come and talk to you. But, uh, I, I, you know, inertia has always been a problem and mm. uh, it's a shame people get fired for exposing the assumptions that they uh, they make that we've made but we like in business to talk about challenge and we like to say yes we we encourage and want challenge but yes i i bumped into quite a few organizations where by that what they actually mean is i as an executive are going to challenge you on whether you've done what i've asked you to do not mm. that you point out that my order to send the troops over the cliff is not exactly a sensible order. Now, I, in which case, I, I, I know Vicky's got that question, so I will now shut up and go away again. Yeah, so, so, the, so Vicky's saying, what's the approach that works best for you for accepting mapping within an organization? So I would say, A, organizations do not accept mapping, it's individuals, and B, it depends on the individual. So I, and the way, I mean, it, sometimes it's been in a pub over a pint talking about it, Sometimes it's, you know, it's pointing, pointing people towards Simon and the, the presentations or the YouTube stuff or the book. And sometimes it's just scrappy in a, over a coffee or whatever, drawing little maps and scrapping stuff out. And I think the important thing is that, you know, you may have to do that many, many, many times over, over many, many months. It can, and it can take, you know, it can take, you know, over a year for some people to understand or to get mapping or to see how it, how it can help them and how it can support kind of what they're doing. And some people just get it straight away. And it's just, it just depends on the person really. And I think you just have to try and experiment with different techniques and different ways with people. And, you know, if one way doesn't work, then try another way, you know, and, and just experiment a bit. So another question, can you mention any type of hurdle that you face using maps with people? I suppose one of the, one of the so the best thing about Wardy Mapping is Simon Wardley and some, sometimes the worst thing about Wardy Mapping is Simon Wardley. So when you, when you look at mapping, you say, go and have a look at Simon, you know, depending if, what particular day it is, you know, Simon could be tweeting about, you know, good stuff about mapping, or he could be, you know, slagging off the, the prime minister or something. So sometimes, um, it's, it's, it, you need to pick your times, yeah. And you need to point people with the appropriate information, depending who they are. And I think, you know, that's, that, that, that can be a hurdle. Yeah. But I think most people kind of get over that. And the other time is just some people, you know, they don't. They don't want to learn. They don't want to know about mapping. They don't care. And I'd just say, you know, just work with the women really. And you know, not everybody needs to understand maps. Simon, uh, right from Simon, what would be your top three tips for getting organizations to, to map? Go and speak to Simon Wardley would be number one. <laughs> uh, I would say, no, again, I don't think it's organizations that map It's the people that map. So you've got to find the right people who have an incentive to use maps to either tell a particular story or overcome a particular problem. So I would identify the people that make the decisions about the problems or the challenges and work with them to, for them to understand mapping or yeah, I think, you know, that's kind of it really. Yeah. Uh, top three tips. Yeah. Uh, second tip. I don't know. Just don't give up. That would be my third tip. Yeah. Right. I think we're just, we've got two minutes left. So any quick questions? All right, Chris is back. Hi, Chris. Terminator is back. <laughs> no questions, but if anyone wants to grab a coffee, water, take a short break, that's I think the right the right time, and we start the next round of presentations in two minutes. Okay.
Thank you, Mark. It was a fabulous right. Thanks, everybody. Discussion. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.